So guys, we have reached to our first agenda of the day. Hmm. But before that, I have one question for you guys. Do you know that Malaysia is one of the most obese countries in Asia? Guys, that's the bitter truth. I didn't make that up. That's a fact. However, don't worry because today we have an expert with us today which will focus on helping employers to understand 10 reasons why employees are overweight and how it impacts productivity and what are the approaches corporations can take to address the issue. Kevin Zahri, who is currently the director of KZ Events, is an award-winning US certified personal trainer and nutritionist with over 15 years of experience. Kevin is also the founder of Malaysia's largest weight loss movement called Jomkurus. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's ask Kevin, what are the reasons? Kevin, the stage is yours. Okay, assalamualaikum and a very good morning. Thank you, June, for the very kind uh, introduction. Uh, good morning to everybody. Welcome to uh, Work X Health uh, with the Star. Uh, congrats to the Star for putting together uh, an amazing uh, two-day workshop virtually. Uh, the new norm for I think everyone uh, in Malaysia and around the world. This is actually my very first uh, virtual conference, and I have to be honest, it's uh, different. Uh, I'm used to interacting uh, with the crowd, with all of you as well. But uh, we have to, what we call in Malaysia, bersyukur dengan apa yang ada and uh, really make the best out of the situation that we've been given. But uh, with all these changes as well, whether it is personally or at work, uh, we have to count our blessings. Uh, it could be a lot worse. Now, my talk for today is really all about giving my insights uh, to you about the 10 reasons why your employees are overweight and uh, perhaps this is really a personal uh, 30 minute or so sharing uh, not just about me and my experience but I am sure every one of you who is watching uh, you have your own experiences with fitness, uh, weight management, corporate wellness and uh, I would like very much that I can share my insights with you uh, but uh, God willing, at the end of my slot, we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, so feel free to ask uh, as many questions as you have uh, to make it something relevant for you personally uh, that you can apply to yourself perhaps, uh, but also more importantly, bring these uh, teachings, learnings back to your cooperation uh, to help uh, combat uh, obesity in Malaysia, which has been a problem for forever really uh, malaysia is uh, the largest or has the highest rate of obesity in asia if we're not, not number one we're typically around number one two or three uh, we're finding it out with uh, brunei but i think there's no denying that uh, obesity is a huge problem in malaysia uh, whether at work communities schools as well and it's a problem that really requires everyone to play their part and it is not a crash course six week everyone is kurus or already in shape it really is going to take a generation uh, over many many initiatives uh, which again you can play a part in now i personally have been active in the industry really for the last uh, i don't know 15 20 years i know i may look young on tv but in reality no spring chicken here i am uh, 42 years old uh, so again, the times do change in terms of taking care of my own health as well. But I've been conducting, I think last, last night I was trying to calculate how many talks I've given with various corporate sectors, uh, private and public. And I would probably look at close to a thousand uh, sessions uh, from various corporations, from oil and gas to industries, manufacturing, the government sector and schools as well. And no matter which company you work in, there's always... Uh, a high percentage, high percentage of uh, obesity, uh, which is something that uh, requires a lot of attention because like it or not, there's a cost component uh, to obesity, whether it is productivity, uh, absenteeism, and of course, um, uh, insurance costs and medical expenses. So now for today's session, which is very limited, I have another about 20 minutes or so. I want to share with you my experience over the years in uh, helping individuals lose weight, whether on the public arena or on the corporate sector. Uh, what are the main reasons that uh, employees or individuals can't seem to get their weight under control? Now, 
Number one, uh, very important is really the lack of fundamental understanding. And I, I would like to put you guys on the spot. I know I cannot see you. I was told there are thousands, hundreds, sorry, hundreds of you right now watching this, hopefully from a safe space uh, at your office or at home. And I want to put you on the spot. I want to ask you a question. Uh, you, you can try and answer it yourself or let me know at the end of the session uh, whether you get it right. But uh, I do these kinds of Q&As a lot during the programs as well. And uh, the question is this. Assuming uh, an individual named uh, City consumes uh, 1,500 calories per day. City consumes 1,500 calories per day, but she burns 2,000 calories per day. Now, again, she burns 2,000, uh, but she consumes 1,500 calories. Assuming her weight today is 60 kilos, what will her weight be tomorrow? More, same or less? And exactly what will her weight be tomorrow? That's question number one. Again, it's your own free will. So, I was saying is to answer the question, but try and think about it. It's the most fundamental question about weight management. And question number two, it's durian season right now. And uh, everyone in the, the room here is lighting up with the word of durian. And the question is this, uh, do durian contain cholesterol, yes or no? Does the fruit of durian contain cholesterol, yes or no? Very fundamental question. Many get it right or wrong. I'm not going to give you a hint, but uh, try and figure it out. And uh, number three, uh, if a person wants to flatten his or her tummy in this room as well, <laughs> If a person does uh, amazing abdominal workouts, crunches, yada yada yada, will that help this person compiscan uh, perot or flatten the tummy? Do abdominal workouts help you to actually flatten the tummy? Those are the three most fundamental questions that I would like you to think about. Uh, we can discuss it at the end of the uh, session, but try and think about it again because everything is really about fundamentals. It's really the same thing with running a corporation. It all comes down to the fundamental management of finance, HR, manufacturing. And when it comes to health, it's really all about the fundamentals, which most people don't grasp from the beginning. That's number one. Number two, unrealistic expectation. In most of our programs, we do this very, very popular a uh, six-week weight loss campaign around the country with many corporations as well. It's a lot of fun. It's a six-week program, but on the day number one, uh, majority of the employees uh, come in with really high expectation, wanting to lose some 10, 15 kilos in a span of six weeks. Now, I blame social media really for these unrealistic expectations because these kind of success stories always make uh, the viral stories of someone losing maybe 10, 15 kilos in a week. And they don't lie, but it does not quite give you the true picture. And uh, these unrealistic expectations are typically a result of, again, false, false media and uh, really also about the lack of understanding, uh, which then leads to expectation, which is purely based on what people see and hear in the news. And because of this expectations which are unrealistic, it creates a sense of failure when they don't quite get to what their targets were. So it's the same thing with your employees having a KPI. If the KPI is unrealistic, it creates a false sense of failure or purpose. So setting the right expectations for us uh, in any corporate or public program is really the main key. And I've been instructed right now to move myself physically to the left. Yes. All right. In life, something will always go right. In life, something will always go wrong. And that will lead me to probably tip number seven. I'm going to jump the queue a little bit. I'll, I'll go back to number three later. But since we're at the topic of moving myself physically somewhere, something will always go right. Something will always go wrong. When it comes to weight management and our program, most individuals don't allow themselves to make mistakes. 
They think about this perfect diet, perfect exercise, perfect weight loss journey. They think about a stock price, which either goes steadily up all the way or steadily down all the way, but they can't really accept the up and downs that comes with a process, a roller coaster of weight management, and that creates stress. But if an individual understands that it's a package deal, a virtual, work, a virtual session like this comes with right and wrong, and you are accepting uh, of these mistakes, then the journey becomes a lot more mengembirakan, which in English basically means it's a happy journey. And that brings us to number three, which is happiness and stress. I am known as a happy guy. I don't know why, but everywhere I go, people say I always smile a lot, and I'm always happy. And they always tell me that they struggle with their, with themselves and their happiness. Now, don't get me wrong. Weight loss, yes, requires a lot of understanding and education. But if mentally within yourself you are unhappy due to stress, Facebook, no money, too much money, COVID nineteen, yada yada yada, a lot of stresses in life uh, can create unhappiness. And if you are unhappy, uh, it relates to stress. And stress leads to various avenues, which can then compound the problem. As an example, conversation happened yesterday with an employee uh, who used to work for the publishing sector as well, company I shall not mention. Uh, he lost his job, I think, about few few months ago for various reasons, and uh, he he he's stressed. Life is stressful, and he channels the stress to food which again makes it a problem which is just going to make it worse. Now, individuals, companies, corporations, schools even, we all are faced with stress. But the key for me, and this is cakap senang, it's easy to convey, uh, you need to find a way to channel the stress in a way that makes it meaningful. Now, exercise is one of the best way to channel stress. During the whole lockdown period, I was at home as well. I was not allowed to leave the house by my wife. Why? <laughs> she told me I don't take good care of my hygiene. She doesn't trust me with the sanitizer and all, which is fair enough. Uh, I think that's why also I think more and more men have uh, COVID-19, I thought I was told, than uh, women, because women are more hygienic per se, but different topic. So, um, Basically, I, I used home workouts. We conducted the daily live home workouts on Instagram and Facebook, and it helped me to really channel stress in a really confined uh, environment where you are stressed because you don't have much space. You can't go out and release stress. So you don't have an avenue that's productive to release stress to make you happy. You go to the kitchen and you makan. Eh? You makan and you makan and you makan and it just compounds the problem. So don't underestimate the happiness in the part of making your employees lose weight. If your corporate structure is extremely stressful, and many of these corporate structures, depending on the industry that you're in, are stressful, uh, you need to make corporate wellness something that is happy. It should resound happiness individual wanting to join a corporate wellness initiative, which many, if not all, companies have. But if the corporate wellness initiative itself becomes stressful because of the KPI and you must do this and that, then it becomes something that they don't want to do and it adds more stress instead of actually helping your employees to release stress. When I, when we do, the, when we do, when we do, do, when we go to corporations and uh, more physical adjustment, Backwards, is it? So, sorry, too, too aggressive right now. So I'm trying to... Oh, the mic is over here! So if I move forward, there's no mic. Okay, again, mistakes are all right. Yeah. So now again, uh, if I go to corporations and we consult uh, various industries on running a corporate wellness program, we try to not force uh, HR or training managers to force employees to join because once they are forced to join, it sort of disrupts the happiness of the program opposed to the individuals who actually want to join voluntarily. Now, to be honest here, and we run public programs, school programs, and corporate programs, to be very honest with you, corporate programs are less impactful opposed to public programs. And I tell this to every 
uh, client that we meet. Why? Because if you do a wellness program within the structure of your organization, and I know you have to because of uh, corporate social responsibilities and so forth, uh, it always reminds them of work. Even while they squat or they do their jumping jacks, next to them is their manager and their colleague that reminds them of reports and graphs, opposed to when they join an outside program where they are not reminded of individuals who remind them of work. Because like it or not, there is a stress component that comes uh, together with work. So what we then encourage corporations to do is to perhaps sponsor or provide the funds to the employees, empower them and allow them to join outside activities, join outside gyms, which many corporations do as well. They have corporate gym memberships with uh, commercial public gyms which again provides them an avenue that they can feel free and not are constantly reminded of work. So happiness is an extremely important component. Number four, and I'm running out of time really quick, uh, surroundings are key. If surroundings are not conducive, either at home or in the workplace, uh, it does not provide a, a conducive environment for someone to make the change, whether it's the family, the community, the school, or even the corporate environment. If the leadership, the environment, the work-life balance is not quite what you want it to be, it's really hard for someone to make the change. As an example, if a person wants to change his or her diet, but he's constantly surrounded by individuals who don't condone, who don't support uh, or who then don't have that similar type of diet management or lifestyle habits. It's really difficult for one person to, to thrive and shine and outshine the, the individuals or the others. So it's really important for the leadership uh, of your corporation to sort of take the torch lead by example, not just for one day, because one day does not cultivate change. It has to be a sustainable program that runs throughout uh, the year. I am most busy end of the year. Why? Because a lot of companies have to use up their budget because they cannot use it for the next year. So again, you squeeze everything into a short period of time to satisfy the needs, but it does not cultivate sustainable change. So if you would like a productive healthy, happy, fit workforce, it really needs to be a seamless, uh, sustainable initiative that runs from January all the way to uh, December. You may even want to look at having a dedicated team that plans various activities. So it does not appeal to just the executives, but upper management, your CEOs, but it has to be driven down top to bottom, has to be supported bottom to up, can't just do what the CEO wants, but has to be about the individuals that you would like to help. In my case, it's the public or corporations, but for you as a uh, corporate wellness representative of your company, uh, it should be the very employees that you would like to help. All right, so now number five, a lot of individuals fail in their ability to lose weight because they have this do or die approach. Do or die approach means they go on these whack diets, uh, which no rice, no nasi, no bread, no sugar, no this, no that. Can I? You will not last long because it does not make you happy. Makanan, we say in Malay, makanan menggembirakan. Durian menggembirakan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes. <laughs> no. Food is joy at the end of the day, and joy brings happiness. If you deprive yourself of the foods that you enjoy, uh, it's not going to be a sustainable journey. It's the same thing with work. If the work is not enjoyable, it is hard to sustain. But if the work is too enjoyable, then it's not serious. That's also a problem because Food, if it's too much joy, it's going to add the weight. Too much durian, too much joy, not really advisable. Same thing goes for calories as a whole. So then it comes down to that balance, that balance of happiness and stress. Same thing with exercise. Exercise should make you happy, 
But too much of it leads to stress physical, uh, leads to injuries not going to help. So it's really a balance of uh, putting yourself through something challenging to make yourself change. Same thing with work. If you're always faced with the same tasks every single day, it becomes redundant and it becomes boring. This is my first virtual session. Challenging! I don't know who I'm talking to, but it is something that makes me more experienced uh, in the future, having done something like this. So challenges uh, bring experience. Uh, it brings growth. Same thing goes for exercise and dieting. So that balance really of uh, happiness, avoiding the do or die approach when it comes to dieting or weight loss is really key so that it becomes something that is flexible and uh, sustainable. All right, next we're going to go with number six. Again, forget about the numbers. I hope that it is far meaningful. Uh, next we're going to go with follow rather than owning. Now this comes back to the Malaysian education, uh, which we are trying to change together with the Ministry of Health. We, we have a very big uh, campaign involving thousands of schools to really instill creative health education from young so that when they become adults, that lifestyle and habits are already embedded in their DNA from young. But unfortunately, currently, uh, our, our education tends to be a bit of follow what is being taught and uh, that's what you do. So when it comes to our programs as well, we always have the saying of don't follow anything I say. Don't follow anything I say. Why? Because if you just blindly follow what I say or do, it doesn't really help you to understand and own the problem. The idea is to listen to various nutrition advice because even if it's not me, there will be other speakers and dietitians and doctors that come to your companies and give presentations. But if the audience just dryly absorbs the knowledge, but doesn't really know how to question it, then they, need, they, they never really get to own and empower themselves to then solve their own problem. It's the same thing with work. At the end of the day, you learn the basics in school, but then at the end of the day, you need to be able to apply it in a real life environment and adjust according to the needs. So my advice in any corporate wellness program is uh, get the programs to not just follow the exercises, but question the why and then the how. So it becomes something that the individual can mempersoalkan, uh, question for themselves, whether it suits the individual or not. Because for example, even jumping jacks sound and look very, very simple. But for someone who's in their 50s, uh, who may have some knee injuries or lower back problems, this may not be the best advice for someone to do, even though it is as simple as instruct telling you go and do 40 jumping jacks. If I do a corporate seminar and I say, let's go, they all go. But at the end of the day, you have to question whether it is appropriate for the individual or not. And that is empowerment instead of simply following. Time-wise, I only have seven minutes left. So let me run through it real quick. Number eight, people give up too easily. I have seen it so many times and it is extremely frustrating for a person who wants to help others. People give up way, way too easily uh, when it comes to overcoming themselves. Weight management, and I'm sure you can relate to this watching this right now. Weight management, fitness, health is between you and you. It's really about over overcoming the person that you see in the mirror. I can give you all the advice that you want, but at the end of the day, you have to be the one you know, filling the food into your mouth, you have to be the one managing your time. You have to be the one managing your uh, motivation, which is very subjective to every individual. And uh, the most frustrating part for me is to A, see someone lose 20 kilos, great. But then over the years, suddenly you meet them again and their weight has rebounded again, probably back to what it used to be two, three years ago, and a lot of people give up when they are faced with difficulties because, again, they channel difficultiness into a stressful situation and channel it to food, and then they give up because they expect the journey to constantly be 
perfect. So my advice uh, to you as a corporation as well is same logic. If you have faced or are facing uh, obesity in your corporation, uh, don't always try to do the same thing again and again and again. Uh, you need to innovate, be creative about finding solutions so that you as a corporation don't give up uh, on solving it because again, a happier, healthier, stronger workforce uh, is more productive and creates a more conducive environment for everyone. All right, so now, last thing before we open for Q&A uh, is change takes time. And I know there's this bumper sticker card that says to change your habit takes X number of days, but that is not true. That just looks good on social media, which many things do, but in reality does not work. Change does not really have a time stamp to it. For some individuals, change can take a week. For some, it's just waking up and have some kind of chronic disease that requires immediate decision to change. For others, it takes years to sort of linger some, themselves through a process of change. There is no black and white do or don'ts when it comes to change. For corporations as well, it's not going to be a six-week fix uh, to fix weight management or health. It is a never-ending, continually evolving uh, cycle, roda, roda, how do you say roda in English? Wheel, it's a never, never ending wheel that turns, that requires continuous uh, adjustments. Even for me personally, health in my 20s, 30s and 40s is always continually evolving, but I make it a sustainable journey so that the end of the day doesn't become something I have to look at once a year and look at all the hutang that I have. If you make health a uh, once a year campaign, there's a lot of baggage that you drag with it. But if you make it sustainable throughout the year, then it becomes a less stressful, impactful, painful process and it becomes something that becomes norm. At the end of the day, you want to make corporate wellness a norm. For it to become a norm, it needs to be sustainable. It needs to be throughout the year. It needs to be continually evolving. And it needs to be fun so that it's not just fun for the people who are in it, but it's also fun for the very uh, people who manage and organize it. All right, that's really all from me for the 10 reasons why employees, Malaysians, individuals, you, me, everyone else, uh, is struggling maybe with uh, weight management. And uh, I look forward to answering some questions that I know we have. All right, thank you so much, um, Kevin, for the very energetic uh, presentation this time. I think he had already given like, more than 10 reasons why, so I think we can learn a bit more from that. And we have questions from the, um, the audience, so from Dr. Sharifa. She's asking, when we organize well-being related programs in the company, how do we celebrate healthy food as part of the event when the employees are so used to be served with unhealthy yet super tasty food? One of the attractions to join the event is food. I like this kind of event. Okay, over to you. <laughs> Doctor, so I, I cannot see her name. Doctor Sharifa. Doctor Sharifa. Hey, Sharifa. Thank you for your question. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, I go again to various corporate seminars to conduct uh, talks, and there's always a makan session after the talk, and no one wants to sit with me. Why? <laughs> because they, they they would feel that I would uh, make comments and judge them on their food choices, and most of the time you are right. The the food choices are not great. Uh, but it's better that they are... Now, I would not say that it's better that they are not great. For me, the food choices have to be real. Now, let me give you an example uh, of Bank Nagara. Bank Nagara, I've done various programs with them. They have a good eating culture whereby the food choices during programs generally are always healthy-ish, not like the white healthy where it's totally white. Not yang paling merepek hitam yang memang ke laut. It's always agak moderate with decent proteins, fibers, carbohydrates. So uh, my advice is don't make the food choices about a singular corporate event. Make the food choices at corporations a sustainable change 
So that, that is the new norm, that every corporate function has similar kinds of food choices, which are healthy, moderate, but not really crazy on both spectrums. Doing a healthy corporate lunch once a year does not drive change. It has to be a culture that starts from today, maybe, and ongoing. Okay, the, the key takeaway there is to start is easy, but to maintain is hard. So what we can do as a corporation, we, we have to always have a sustainable plan so that we can make change through that. Okay, we have another question from Chong. Um, talking about corporate wellness initiative, I know, I know of some companies which include BMI measurement as part of the KPI. So do you encourage this for corporate to come all with stuff? So what do you think? Uh, thank you for your question, Chong. Um, I personally am not a big fan of BMI measurement as part of the KPI. Uh, it creates more stress. Uh, I would rather that the company makes it a an open uh, KPI, maybe for those who need the pressure. Uh, I, I've done various programs with oil and gas companies where the BMI is a must because otherwise they can't fly on a chopper and go offshore. So it really depends on the organization. I am not a fan of forcing people to do anything, but I would rather give them an avenue where they see that this value added pressure on putting the BMI on the KPI is something positive and then bring up programs to help the individuals combat it. Simply putting the BMI as a KPI without a follow through program is lazy. So if you want to have a more, uh, maybe a more positive outcome that brings change, make the KPI, the BMI part of the KPI fine, but you must have programs to actually support and uh, encourage those individuals to then meet those KPIs. And one thing about the BMI, the BMI is really a very simple ratio of your weight and your height. If you have an individual who has naturally uh, a bit more muscle mass, his BMI would be naturally higher. Not always the best parameter or measurement to dictate whether someone is healthy or not. Yeah, weight is just a number. Okay, we have more questions from the audience. Keep it coming. So the next one is from Ka Sang. Kevin has repeatedly mentioning happy and happiness. How do you constantly finding happiness in, in your opinion, Kevin? <laughs> it's a very, thank you for the question, Ka Sang. Now, happiness is something I think we all crave. Uh, happiness is a pursuit. Uh, it is a never-ending journey to constantly find a balance that makes us happy. Uh, happiness is not a destination, if I may say. What that means is you can't really arrive at happiness and that's it. You are never really 100% happy. It's always uh, a journey of making sure that happiness sort of supersedes the stress so that it helps you to stay above the water, whether it is me or you, we all have stresses. It's really important to identify stresses and then there are physical stresses. Obesity is physical stress. You have your Facebook, social media, mental strain. You have the work stress. You have the physical exercise stress. You have family stress. So as an individual like myself, uh, my ratio of happiness and stress is something very unique to me. I know exactly what makes me happy and that may change uh, over the years. I know exactly what I don't like and, and try uh, to stay away from. So I make sure that I focus my energy on things that make me happy. And I, I spoke to this gentleman yesterday as well, again, who lost his job. I always told him I, I exercise more when I am unhappy. Why? Because I need to find a way to channel the stress to an area that is productive. And I give him a, an example. Uh, I was really not depressed that I was really down when my mom passed away a long, long time ago. I was a young 24 year old boy uh, studying in the US. My final year, my mom passed away uh, as a young man, very hard to cope with. Uh, and I knew A, it's going to be a long journey of recovery from losing your, your mom. 
And uh, B, I, mean, I have two choices. A, I can channel the sadness and anger to self-destruction, which is very easy to do. Or I can channel the, the pain and stress to something meaningful. So what I did, uh, I signed up for a triathlon. First time in my life, uh, I put a six, six months schedule to train. So I really train every day uh, for this triathlon to honor maybe my mom in that case. But it helped to channel something negative to positive because like it or not, every scenario has two sides to the coin. Whether it's work, family, life, COVID-19, life has two sides. So you choose uh, which side to, to, to look at, but you have to be aware of both coins. You can't be in denial and just live, live happily ever after. There's no such thing. Uh, it's good to be aware of the ups and downs, but try to always see the positivity. But I know it's cakap senang. If you have this habit of looking at things negatively for many, many years, and this is again, change of mindset, it is going to take time. How long, I do not know, but you have to constantly remind yourself to think about the positive first before looking at the flip side of it. Challenging, but challenging itself makes me happy. I don't like easy things. I like things that are hard because hard gives me growth. Growth makes me happy. Failure is not a negative. Failure is learning because you learn about the things that don't work. If I fa fall on my face, I learn something new. If this session went horribly wrong, for whatever reason, I do not know, life will go on, it will be all right, and I would have learned a lot. So don't shy away from change. Don't shy away from uh, challenging times. Uh, use it as a blessing. And if I can use one more example, I stay in Monkiara and uh, there are a lot of expats and there are these amazing uh, Japanese uh, moms, yeah? And Monkiara is a hill, if you've been there, and they, they walk up the hill, yeah? With shopping bags left and right, walking back from the grocery store. One child in the front, one child at the back, walking up the hill, but they are smiling, happy, good morning to you, why? because they are honoring their family by hard labor, hard work, but it gives them satisfaction. So when it comes to change, you need to look at the challenge of you allowing to honor your being to become a better version of yourself instead of dwelling in the problems. Dwelling in problems does not solve anything. I had friends of mine who, who had lost their gyms during this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, very unfortunate, very hard, but uh, we had this quote in our group of friends that, that said, if you are in hell, keep going. You cannot just stay there and wait for things to change because it's hell. You have to march forward. It can't get much worse than that. And eventually you find your way out and you would have, can look back at the journey that was meaningful hard but a blessing in disguise and we don't know what the future brings and that is hope hope brings happiness all right i think the audience are very energetic too now so because we're receiving a lot of questions so we have another question from aileen so minimum how frequent should we aim to exercise so is there any minimum <laughs> yeah what do you think about it i like i like aileen you go for the minimum and the minimum not the maximum now, uh, let's not talk about the minimum. Exercise is not a must. Yeah, It's not wajib, what we call it uh, in Malay. Uh, exercise is great for many, 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 many reasons, whether it's cardiovascular fitness, strength, stress management. But more importantly, Eileen, is to not look at exercise alone as a chore, but look at the lifestyle as a whole. Look at your walking, house chores, parenting, moving, climbing up and down, doing things that are not traditional exercises, but things that make you an active lifestyle. I went to Japan uh, a few years ago uh, under a trip sponsored by the government to look at the Japanese way of life. They don't exercise that much, but they walk a lot. Uh, they don't drive cars, but they walk and they do and they do and they do. Like the lady, you know, doing her chores with the groceries. 
doesn't always have to be exercise. Uh, my kids are very active. They play everywhere, but they don't call it exercise. Now, if you want to talk about the traditional exercise, once a week is fine, twice a week is fine, zero to one here and there, it's up to you. But most importantly, Eileen, I would encourage you to move as much as you can. Every movement burns calories. What I would not recommend you to do, this may be shocking, I would not recommend Eileen to exercise every single day. Why? Exercise is physical stress on your body and without rest, that can lead to a higher risk of injury. So I will personally limit my exercises to maybe three, four, five times a week max. As you get older, recovery takes longer, have to be more mindful of injuries, wear and tear. So again, there's no common rule, but uh, move as much as you can. Make your life exercise and menggerakkan diri, yeah? just to activate yourself. All the best to you, Eileen. Okay, all the best to Eileen too for me. And uh, yeah, we have a lot more questions, but due to time constraint, we're going to receive two more. So from RJ, Kevin, comment please. Do you think it's important to educate the aging group to keep fit too? Yeah, that's a very, very good question, RJ. Uh, there's two things I would like to talk about on that issue. Number one, uh, my own experience, my granddad, uh, he's German. He, we grew up in Germany. Uh, he, he passed away in his late 80s. But up until his mid-80s, he walked every day. He used to walk from his house uh, to his so-called coffee shop, which is probably like 2 or 3 km away. Uh, they had a lot of time. So my grandparents biked, walked. They had a garden. Uh, I know it's different uh, surroundings compared to Malaysia, but they were never encouraged to not do anything. Unfortunately, sometimes, our culture wants to let the elderly rest. And once they start resting, even mentally they start to shut down. So what we should do instead, now not do jumping jacks, because that again is not conducive for them, but goes back to the Eileen scenario again as well. Just get them to be active mentally and physically uh, with walking, gardening, that prohibits playing with their grandchildren as well. One thing that we are working on, which is the second point, uh, we are working on a campaign with the government as well. I guess it's a long-term campaign on creating uh, community sport leagues for the warga amas, the elderly, so that they can compete in the sports that they love uh, with people at the same age so that they can have a year-long sustainable uh, lifestyle. Uh, with people who enjoy the sports or the hobbies that they enjoy as well. The problem sometimes is with the elderly, uh, the community integration is not always very good. So we hope to then integrate communities for the elderly to allow them to be active around the year. Cakap senang, very challenging, something that we are working on. Thank you, RJ. All right, we have come to the last question of the day, also from Dr. Sharifa. How do you sustain change in organization when only a small group keen for it? I think it's a good question as well. Again, uh, Doctor, thank you so much. If only a small group uh, wants to change, start with that small group and make that small group super awesome, super fun, super successful and make the small group the envy of um, the others so that they all want to become part of it. That's how we grew the, the Jum Kuros program as well. Uh, we started off with a really small group, made it very tight ukwa among the, the individuals. A lot of amazing pictures and fun experience like white water rafting, dodgeball, paragliding. Make it so awesome that the others will look into the group and wish that they are part of it. So you have the luxury of managing a smaller group, which is easier than sometimes bringing change to a larger group, but it's in your hands to make the small group as awesome as they are. All right, Kevin, I know I mentioned that one was the last question, but we have another one. I think the audience love you so much, so they have a lot to ask. So again, from Queenie, 
Can we slim down to our desired weight and shape without the help of weight management program or weight management supplements? Wow, what do you think, Evan? Okay, Karini, thank you for your question. 100% yes, you can absolutely lose weight, get in the shape of your life without the help of any slimming center, without the help of any weight loss product. Don't believe the promises that the weight loss products tell you. It's something I am combating as well to provide uh, consumer protection because the, the janji janji manes, the sweet promises that they make uh, don't work the way they do. There is no miracle cure. There is no magic product. If there was, then all of us would be in great shape, but it does not work that way. Every supplement supplements kekurangan or something that is lacking perhaps in your life. You have food supplements and non-food supplements. The most common, most misunderstood supplement is the fat burner. And when I say fat burner, a lot of you are intrigued because fat burner, baka lama, it sounds exactly like what you want to achieve. Reality is it does not burn fat at all. It does not. The ingredient in a fat burner is just really like caffeine, guarana, yuhimbe, or mahuang. It's basically a stimulant that increases your metabolic rate slightly. When I say slightly, it could be 0.1%, 0.5%, 1%, nothing at all. It's just like you drinking your Starbucks coffee. It impacts people differently. If it works for you, there will be side effects just like caffeine. Uh, if you have a fat burner, you always feel like something is happening, but nothing is happening because you always feel on the edge. You have anxiety, you're nervous, you're restless, insomnia. People don't use it for a long period of time because they feel uneasy and it does not work the way they think it does. The first time a person buys this fat burner product, they're so excited because they think tomorrow wake up, kudos already. But cannot, it does not work that way at all. There was this famous, I think C-SPAN or E-SPAN coverage in the US of A, where they called upon Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz is a very famous uh, American TV personality. And he was called upon in C-SPAN to, I don't know what they call it, Senate or what in the US, uh, to answer a query about him promoting uh, this Garcinia Cambodia as a weight loss magic pill because he is a person of influence and a lot of his viewers then believe what he says. So he was asked by the panel, was asked, Dr. Oz, can a person who is overweight, uh, consume this, this, this product, this pill and magically lose weight as you claim? He was trying to, Goreng, 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 goreng the reply. You can Google this on YouTube. And then they, they stopped him. Again, Dr. Oz, can a person who is struggling with their weight take this pill and lose weight? Yes or no? He said, no. Why? Because it does not work the way you think. So then they asked him again. So what would you as a doctor recommend a person who is overweight do to manage their weight? He said two things. A, you have to move, yeah, increase your overall calorie output. And B, you have to manage the number of calories that you eat. That brings us to the very, 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 very first thing we spoke about earlier this morning. Weight management, like it or not, is all about the basics of calories in, calories going out. I know it's extremely boring, but that is the bottom of it all. Like a car. If you eat minya of a car, yeah, and you fuel the car with more gas than the car burns, then you, your tanky minya will grow and grow and grow and grow. And you can think about the tank as your fat. If you fill in more food than you're actually burning, that car will become heavier and heavier and heavier. To reverse this, put in less gas than you are burning. Burn more than you are putting in so that your body needs to start getting uh, using the tanky minya, that tank storage as fuel to help you reduce weight. That is weight loss 101, which is the most basic, but not very interesting. People like this kurang seven kilo one week thing, which manipulates water, different story. We have no time for that, I was told. <laughs>
All the best, Queenie. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Kevin, for the sharing just now. So, if yesterday we learned that we need to always stretch ourselves, today we have to always move, okay? If, if you are in the office, anywhere you are now, move. Don't forget to move, okay? So, um, Kevin, I believe um, there are a lot of audience have a lot of questions to you. So, do you think um, they can reach you in any social media or do you have any final words for them? Yeah, if you have more questions about anything personally or for your corporation, uh, you can reach out to me at kevinzari.com. You can Google my name, Kevin Zari. Uh, we are active on Instagram, Facebook as well. And yeah, I would love to hear from you guys. And uh, my advice to you is don't overcomplicate uncomplicated things, whether it is nutrition, exercise, or corporate wellness. Have fun and make it sustainable. All the best and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, Thank you. So maybe next time we're going to have another session with you, maybe like live virtual Zumba or anything. So for now, that's it from Kevin. Thank you and see you guys after this.